Hey everyone, here on Comic Island, we've been reviewing Brother Voodoo and his early history throughout Marvel Comics. Now I'm going to be sharing all my thoughts on the comics he's appeared in so far in our videos and how he functioned as an obscure character in his early days. So, let's begin. In 1973, Stan Lee, apparently wanting to increase Marvel's pool of black superheroes, had an idea for a new hero who would use occult powers and black magic. Then editor-in-chief Roy Thomas suggested they would call him Dr. Voodoo, at which point Lee settled on the name Brother Voodoo. Brother Voodoo was passed off to talent like Len Wein and John Romita Sr., and in Strange Tales number 169, the character made his debut appearance. Unlike most others, Voodoo did not experience an immediate surge in popularity. Though the early stories featuring Jericho Drum are actually pretty decent in terms of both quality and their role in establishing Brother Voodoo as a superhero, if anything, his appearances scared Christian American readers who interpreted this character and his abilities as some form of Satanism. Marvel was then pretty sophisticated in how they looked at such responses though, as they deliberately fed into these reactionaries, posting the most extreme letters they got in response to this character while recognizing that these reactionary individuals didn't reflect their larger audience, even way back in 1973. Marvel knew perfectly well that even by this point most people wouldn't care two wits if Brother Voodoo was an outright Satanist and would care a lot more whether he's a fun character worth following. And though Brother Voodoo never exploded in popularity in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, most of his stories from these three decades aren't all that bad. His early books are fun, largely focusing on his struggle with Zuvembis, while also featuring a couple of appearances by Baron Samedi, which are pretty great ways for us to get to know this then-new character a little better. The term Zuvembi, interestingly, is used very heavily in Brother Voodoo's early days. This is because thanks to the Comics Code Authority running at the time, Marvel, for years, chose not to use the word zombie, and over time, Zuvembi has become a sort of supplement for that, referring in-universe to a mystic variant of traditional zombies encountered more during the Silver Age, while behind the scenes it's largely just a quirky term and part of Marvel's past. These stories are not only good, but pretty ballsy. Having a black superhero by then wasn't new for Marvel, but Stanley's commitment to consistently keep adding new characters of color beyond what was probably necessary at the time with a few token choices does show he cared about the issue more than he ever needed to. And even though Brother Voodoo never became a fan favorite, Marvel would continue to use him here and there both to preserve their copyright of the character while also testing the waters to see if the character might work in a certain situation or be valid in a certain series. So after his early comics, Brother Voodoo spends the rest of the 20th century randomly and sporadically appearing in other series. In the 80s, he barely appears across the entire decade, with a huge gap that almost spans the entire 10 years. These crossover stories range in quality a lot more than Voodoo's earliest stories. Some are fun, like his first crossover with Doctor Strange or Spider-Man, while others feel very pointless, like his short appearances in Daredevil or Ghost Rider. The writers of Marvel over the years also tried to push him away from the Brother Voodoo identity in the 90s, only for them to shortly go back to it not long after, as it seems nobody was really sure what to do with the character. I suspect some of this hinges on a certain fear factor most prominently by the 90s, when writers might be intimidated writing about a religion as complex and nuanced as voodoo, when, of course, most of those writers have no experience with it. I feel that, too, the more I read and learn about real voodoo, the less I want to relate that topic to brother voodoo. That's because this character has about the same relationship to real voodoo that Ghost Rider has to real Christianity. The comparison is borderline not worth making, where at best both characters pay lip service to the religious ideas the characters were born from, and generally writers of these characters try and prefer 
to put a little distance between real religious ideas and beliefs compared to the superheroes that are just kind of here to tell a goofy story and have a fun time. That's a lot easier for characters like Ghost Rider than it is for Brother Voodoo, though, since the latter came from a name that literally evokes the religion in question. If it was called Ghost Jesus, you can see where Marvel would have a little bit more trouble with the character. So it's very easy for me to imagine why, at one point, writers wanted to shy away from the Voodoo name entirely and just focus on the identity of Jericho Drum, who is, by the way, an interesting character. His background as a clinical psychologist makes him more mature than the average new superhero. His powers are fun and fairly consistent across his early appearances, though his most interesting power, Daniel Drum's ability to possess others, is actually used surprisingly rarely across Jericho's first few decades in action. His Haitian roots set him apart from a lot of Marvel's other black superheroes that came up before or since. That's part of the tricky business, though, with Jericho. In a company where all these black characters found their success over the late 20th century, including Luke Cage, Falcon, Black Panther, Blade, several X-Men, and Monica Rambeau, Jericho remained so much more obscure and less used in comparison. The simple fact of the matter is, there's something unique about Brother Voodoo that made him less successful as a character. While a lot of his stories are decent, it's hard to pinpoint any as being so exceptional that you can picture fans back in the day pushing Marvel to give Jericho his own series. Drum's repeated and constant encounters with Zuvembis gets very formulaic and predictable very quickly. While over time, Writers from different series and decades would struggle to keep the character consistent, which makes it hard for people to become fans of the character. In one story, like his first crossover with Doctor Strange, Jericho can, and perhaps appropriately, be viewed as a magic wielder who is new to this world, and thus prone to making mistakes. In another earlier story, though, he's tough enough to take aim teaming up with Baron Smeddy all on his own. Jericho's assistant Bamboo is supposedly killed in one tale, then is revealed not to have died in a later comic, only for that same storyline to go out of its way to kill Bamboo all over again. It's very, very messy, made only messier by a story written by troubled comic book figure Scott Lobdell, author of the worst brother voodoo story ever made, where Jericho uses his powers to assault a former lover of his that Lobdell conspicuously chose to whitewash for this story. All the while, the comic is very forgiving towards Jericho for this behavior, even if it does recognize what he did was wrong. It's inconsistent and borderline incoherent when you cobble all these stories together. But it is interesting, this lackluster treatment of Jericho Drum less resembles how Marvel treated its black characters during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, generally, and much more resembles how they treated their more obscure characters. That was always the biggest problem with Brother Voodoo. It's hard to escape the status of being an obscure character in a big shared universe. But, and I know all these very normal, not at all biased, and totally level-headed people are going to love hearing this, Jericho's treatment as a character during this time is most certainly at least colored by his race and especially as his identity as a Haitian. His weird magic powers, nationality, and skin color all helped to other Jericho, and I feel factored a lot into his obscurity at the time. Black Panther, Falcon, all these other characters, they were just more palatable, easier to understand to audiences than Brother Voodoo ever was and that would make Jericho an obscure character all the way until the 2000s. That has as much to do with the nature of Marvel during the 70s as it does its audience, and it really informs stuff like Lavelle's story, honestly making it an outright clean example of racism because of the context behind it, even if that wasn't the intent of the writer. There's just no way to define this when you turn a woman white at the same time you're writing her into a story where she's being assaulted by the protagonist black man. That's insane. That's an insane story to write given the context of American history. 
This also informs the behavior of people like Fred Hembeck, who we haven't actually covered for his content of Brother Voodoo yet, even though it did run during this same time period. Throughout Brother Voodoo's early days, Hembeck would use Jericho as a bit of a gag character, one constantly trying to get his own series, but was considered too lame for it. And it just all feels so mean-spirited when you look at everything together. Hembeck is even the one that drew that awful Lavelle story. Better, more intelligent writers than me have related these early comics to race, how Haitians are viewed historically, and have been treated under colonialism. It doesn't come across great under such evaluations, but I do think such papers are correct to assert these things, but do take it a little far. Most of the early comics by people like Len Wein read as a lot more sincere in just having Brother Voodoo as this fun superhero worthy of adulation as much as any other Marvel character. They really just wanted to establish that for Brother Voodoo and it feels very good natured. Other stuff a little later down the road unfortunately also is colored by this. Yes, I like that first crossover story with Doctor Strange, but it does feel like he's written even as a novice superhero in a way that is kind of digging at the character. As if he's either being damned by low expectations or makes remarkable mistakes that feel out of character for any superhero. Even someone young like Peter Parker wouldn't be making some of the mistakes we see Jericho make in his early career. And as much as I like those early Lang Wine stories, it is a little silly how often Jericho gets knocked out and kind of seems to get out of these situations based on luck more than anything else. That's not super positive character writing, and again, it does feel like we're dancing around a lot of this having to do with his race. Now, again, a lot of these Marvel writers do have a good history of writing well with characters who are black, but perhaps that doesn't extend as well to a person from a country as specifically poor and impoverished as Haiti. It does feel like these writers view such things differently. There's a difference between an African prince or American citizens and a Haitian immigrant. And Marvel's writing during this time very much seems to reflect that, but not really in a positive way. I realize I'm wildly unqualified to talk about a lot of this stuff, and you can read a lot more about these things online, so I'll include links to such things in the video description. But suffice to say, I'm not sure I'll be recommending a lot of these books. There's a fun trade out in the world that reprints his earliest adventures and first appearance, which I think is worthwhile, and that's about it. Even the good stuff he appears in, like Christopher Priest's Black Panther run, or that Gambit series where Voodoo appears as we transition into the 2000s. Jericho's role in those stories is very minor, and he is barely a presence. So yeah, they're fun comics, but they're fun comics for Gambit, or Black Panther. In both cases, there's a lot of potential to the story. Drum's relationship with Wakanda is truly fascinating, but barely touched on in pre-series. While even though it's pretty cool that both Gambit and Jericho live in the same city, they barely get to meet each other once in Gambit's fourth solo series. So disappointment and missed opportunity really define a lot of Brother Voodoo's early days. But these things tend to happen a lot when a character gets this obscure. It's an unfortunate reality for many characters, and though, as stated, Jericho's race is relevant to that discussion, it doesn't define it exclusively either. There's a lot of obscure characters out there in the world of Marvel of all types, and they often get this treatment where storylines are abandoned or forgotten, the characters become inconsistent in how they are treated when they do show up, and ultimately, a lot is left to be desired. And that is very true of Jericho Drum's first three decades as a character. But it's not the end of the story, and this is where things get really interesting. We will return to cover more of Brother Voodoo, as he appears in a series called Halloween Commandos, which is the start in a chain of events that leads to Brother Voodoo becoming an Avenger, Doctor Voodoo, and perhaps most interestingly, Sorcerer Supreme. 
So be sure to subscribe to Comic Island so you can check out those future videos. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time here on Comic Island.